The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextal. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. At this point, we're looking at the birth of Jesus. In the book of Galatians, we read that when the fullness of time was come, Christ came. When the time was right, when the time was full, and God prepared the way in multiple ways through that intertestamental period to make it ready for Christ and the spread of the gospel. Now we enter the New Testament time, and the the thing we focus on in this particular lesson is the birth of Jesus. If we go back to Matthew chapter 1 to start with, We begin to look at the genealogy of Jesus. We're not going to read every single verse in the genealogy of Jesus, but in Matthew chapter 1, we start seeing what we might call Joseph's side of the genealogy, the lineage relating to his earthly father, Joseph. Now, we remember from prophecy that Jesus was born of a virgin, but Joseph was his earthly father by all legal rights. And uh, Joseph has his genealogy here in Matthew chapter 1. In verse 1, it goes all the way back to Abraham. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now, it's interesting that these two particular icons in history are pointed out. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. But Jesus is listed as the descendant of Abraham. That's important because Abraham was promised to bless all nations through his lineage. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, you may remember that it was said, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Jesus, as the Christ, was born as a fulfillment of that prophecy by being a direct descendant from Abraham. Also, in uh, verse 6 of Matthew chapter 1, we also read about the lineage from David. The kingdom, uh, excuse me, the kingdom of David begat Solomon, and Solomon begat others that went through the lineage all the way down to Joseph, the husband of Mary. Joseph was able to uh, trace, I lost my word there for a second, trace his lineage all the way back to King David through the son Solomon. And in verse 16 of that same chapter, we see that all that lineage goes right down to Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Joseph descended from King David and David's son Solomon. Now, as the son of Joseph, Jesus is going to be a proper and legal heir to David's throne. Solomon was the successor of David, and his lineage brought forth Joseph, and Jesus, as the legal son of Joseph, is the legal heir to the throne of David. In uh, the other side of the coin, we read about Mary's lineage in verse in Luke chapter 3. But we understand when we're looking at Abraham or David, the Christ was supposed to come from that lineage. Christ was supposed to come from the lineage of Abraham and the lineage of David. Here is John chapter 7. Hath not the scripture said, Christ cometh out of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was. So keep that in mind. Abraham and David are two important things because the Christ was supposed to come out of that lineage. And we've just seen that on Joseph's side, but as I mentioned, let's now look over at Mary's lineage in Luke chapter 3. This genealogy appears to be that of Mary, and I'll point out why it's different in just a second. But in Luke chapter 3, let's look at verse 23. This lineage kind of starts with Jesus and then kind of works backward. Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, 
which was the son of Heli. And then if we skip down through the genealogy to verse 31. Now remember, Joseph came through the lineage of David through Solomon. But notice this lineage, which was the son of Malia, which was the son of Menon. Remember, we're working backwards now through history. Which was the son of Matatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. The lineage being spoken of in Luke chapter 3 comes through the lineage of David, but not through the son Solomon. It comes through the son Nathan. There's two different sons here being discussed. And now, look, uh, that's why we think this is uh, the lineage of Mary. Mary descended from Nathan. Now, that still puts Mary as a direct descendant of David, doesn't it? So David's seed is still bringing forth Mary, which brought forth the Christ. Uh, but on the, the father's side, coming through Solomon, Jesus as the son of Joseph would be the legal heir to the throne of David. Now look at verse 34 of Luke chapter 3. Once again, going back further in the lineage, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham. There it is again. On Joseph's side, the lineage goes back to David and it goes back to Abraham. And on the mother's side, on Mary's side, it goes back to David and it goes back to Abraham. So no matter which side of the coin you look at, mother or father, Jesus was able to fulfill both of those prophecies by being the son of Mary and the son of Joseph. He was a descendant of David and a descendant of Abraham. So both genealogies, the father and the mother, show Jesus came from Abraham and David, fulfilling the prophecies about each of them. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 mentions this. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. The Christ was to come from the seed of Abraham. And no matter whether you look at Joseph or whether you look at Mary, Jesus' lineage goes directly back to Abraham. And in John chapter 7, as we looked at before in verse 42, Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David? The Christ was to come as a descendant of David. And once again, no matter if you look at Joseph's lineage or Mary's lineage, they all go back to David. Jesus fulfilled both of those prophecies through his lineage. Some of the logistics regarding the birth of Jesus are interesting to note, including his birth location. His birth location was supposed to be Bethlehem Ephrata. Now, if you know your geography, there's two Bethlehems. So it's interesting enough that the prophecy would even say Bethlehem. That's impressive enough to say Bethlehem out of all the cities. But since there were two Bethlehems, the prophecies actually got even more specific and said which Bethlehem. There was one in Judea and there was one in Galilee. And Bethlehem Ephrata is the one in Judea. Notice the prophecy of Micah chapter 5. And verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, there it is, the specific Bethlehem in Judea, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall they come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. An eternal being, right? Notice the last few words, whose goings forth have been from of old, from of everlasting. An eternal being would come from Bethlehem Ephrata. That's God being delivered in the flesh. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, we understand that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy because it says very clearly, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Not the Bethlehem in Galilee, but the Bethlehem in Judea. So Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of genealogy, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of his birth location. 
Something else that's interesting is that in history, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come out of Egypt. Come out of Egypt. The Messiah would apparently be in Egypt and come out of it. Notice Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Well, we understand that Joseph uh, went down to Egypt with his family in Matthew chapter 2. Starting in verse 13, When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. In order to save the life of the child, they went to Egypt. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod. Notice this, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. That's a direct quote from Hosea chapter 11. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, all the males, and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled by uh, that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. They fled to Egypt, and now they're coming out of Egypt, just as the prophecy had said. And that's what Joseph did. He arose and took the young child and his mother, and came out of Egypt into the land of Israel. There's also some interesting things about Jesus prophesied that he would be small or tender or weak, but would become strong. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23, he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, Nazareth wasn't the nicest town that people, people didn't think very highly of Nazareth. It was actually a pretty... Uh, looked down upon a lot by other people. Back in Isaiah chapter 11, some of the prophecy there says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. The word branch there really may mean like a small shoot or a tender plant. A branch is something coming out of something bigger, right? It's a small part coming out. And in verse 10 of that same chapter, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse. You remember Jesse beget David, right? The lineage of David goes back to Jesse. Which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. The Gentiles will look to him, this root of Jesse, this tender plant. Also Isaiah prophesied in chapter 53 in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In reference to the Messiah, Jesus would not be this gorgeous model that everyone just couldn't take their eyes off of. He would just be an ordinary looking kind of guy walking down the street. But it looks that this prophecy says he will grow up small. He will grow up probably not thought very highly of. And living in Nazareth, that's exactly what would happen. They would not think very highly of somebody who came from Nazareth. In Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even though he would start small, he would grow into something very fruitful and powerful. And growing up in Nazareth, here's an example of the attitude people would have toward him. They would probably think he was very despised or small or unworthy. When Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? 
right? When they told him, here's a man, he's doing all these wonderful things, and he's coming out of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, can there any good thing even come out of that place? It was a very probably despised type of place. Of course, the virgin birth is a fulfillment of his birth prophecy. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23, we read about that. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, they weren't actually married yet, but they were basically betrothed or engaged It was a pretty serious engagement too. Sometimes the Bible may refer to them as being married, but this type of engagement was so serious it was practically a done deal. It was just they just had not gone through the ceremony yet. That's how serious the engagement really may have been. So they were espoused together. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. There's a reference to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 that we just looked at. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of genealogy. Jesus is a fulfillment of the prophecies of the right birthplace. Jesus is a fulfillment of coming out of Egypt as was prophesied. Jesus was prophesied as being a a small person, maybe not looked upon highly at first, but then to grow into something uh, great. Jesus was the fulfillment of the virgin birth prophecy. And Jesus is God born as a man. In Matthew chapter 1, as we saw in verse 23, the name he would be given is Emmanuel, interpreted, God is with us. This is God with us. And that brings us to looking at the purpose of the birth of Jesus. Why did God come and live as a man. And even more so, why did he choose to grow up and walk this earth for so many years as a man? You know, I've wondered the question in my own head, could Jesus have just come to earth on a Friday, let's say, gotten crucified, rose again on Sunday, and then left, and still fulfilled the remedy for salvation. But Jesus never, as God, never did anything halfway. Even though he, he would have offered himself as the perfect sacrifice, but he lived an entire lifetime here on this earth, but not because he needed to, because we needed it. He did it in order to benefit us. Why did Jesus come to this earth and be born as a man? What was the purpose of this type of birth? Well, I'll throw out a few. Jesus was God born as a man to become the mediator between God and man. You know what a mediator is? is somebody who settles a dispute. In this particular case, the two parties having a dispute are God and man. When man rebels against God and sins against God, there is now a dispute. There's a, there's a rift between God and man. That that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, God said, you have to be separated from me. Isaiah lets us know that God will not tolerate sin in his presence. He is holy and perfect. So now there's a rift. Man has offended God, and there's a dispute between them. In order to settle that dispute, we need a mediator. In Luke chapter 2, notice the announcement of Jesus' birth. I'm going to read from the American Standard of 1901 version. And there were shepherds in the same country abiding in the field and keeping watch by night over their flock. 
And an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the sign unto you, ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men in whom he is well pleased. This is the verse that you see some different translations on. The King James will basically say, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And we often hear that around the the December part of the year because we think that oftentimes that means we should all be good toward each other at this time of the year. Well, we should be good to each other every day of the year, but notice it says goodwill toward men, toward men, not between men. Not goodwill between men, goodwill toward men. If it's goodwill being given toward men, then somebody who's not man must be giving it. Right? That's just logical. Goodwill toward men is actually referencing anyway God offering His goodwill toward men. Even though we are the ones who are guilty of rebelling against God, God is offering the branch of peace, the olive branch of peace, and offering goodwill and saying, let's rectify this rift, let's settle this dispute, and I'm going to offer my own son to act as a mediator between us so that we can get it settled. The American Standard says, on earth, peace among men in whom he is well pleased. Well, what type of men are well pleasing to God? those that obey him and keep his commandments. And if we obey him and keep his commandments, then we will have peace. We will have peace between man and God because he is willing to forgive if we will obey him. God coming to earth as man and living in the flesh, as John says in John 1.14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What better mediator can you have than somebody who understands both sides completely, right? If you have a mediator between labor and management, what better mediator could you have as somebody who has worked both as labor and as management? They've worked in both and they understand both sides and the needs of both things. If you bring in a mediator who only understands one side, somebody's probably going to get the short end of the stick, But God, living on earth as a man an entire life, understands completely and has went through all the experiences that man has. And therefore, we as humans cannot point to Jesus and say, He's not a good mediator. He doesn't understand what it's like to be human. Oh, but He does. And He he lived it. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, we understand that that's the purpose of Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus was God born as a man to be a mediator. That birth was very important. And that life of living a human life was very important to us. Not only because he would be a good mediator, but because he'd be a perfect example. Jesus being born as a human and living as a human gives us a perfect example to follow. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. What better mediator can you have than someone who understands and lived as a human? And what better example and teacher can you have than someone who did it perfectly? You know, I like watching some of those cooking shows where they bring in the professional chef and they try to teach the amateur how to do it. Well, what better teacher can you have than somebody who could make a dish perfectly? You'd be willing to listen to that person, wouldn't you? Or build a house perfectly. That's somebody I want to listen to when it comes to construction, somebody who can build it perfectly. Well, when Jesus tells us about how to live our lives, he's telling us, and he did it perfectly. That's the best teacher you can have. And that's the best example you can have. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, 
or even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Leaving us an example. And Jesus as a perfect man, why did he need to be a man? Why did he not come just as a spirit? Because Jesus as a perfect man would be the perfect sacrifice and Savior to mankind. What did God lose in the Garden of Eden? The perfect man that God created. Right? God created things, and when God created them, he created them perfect because he's holy and perfect. But man chose to rebel, so God lost a perfect man. What needed to be given back to God to restore what God had lost? A perfect man. That's why none of us could be that perfect sacrifice because we've sinned, and once we've sinned, there goes the perfection. I can't offer myself as a sacrifice back to God as much as I'd like to, at least not as a perfect sacrifice. Only Jesus could do that. Romans 5.18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness. What is righteousness? Psalm 119.172 says, Righteousness is God's commandments. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. How did we get the free gift of salvation? Because the righteousness of one was perfect. Jesus followed God's commands perfectly, and he was a perfect man. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That perfect sacrifice was exactly what humans needed in order to pay back to God what he had lost. And then once God received what he had lost, the dispute can start to be settled, right? We can start to get settled. If you go into a mediation, somebody probably wants damages, right? You wrecked my car. I want, I want my damages. Well, now the price has been paid and we can get down to settling this dispute once and for all. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And as the book of Hebrews does, it makes a comparison to the Old Testament. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's what happened in the Old Testament. Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. But as Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats was never restoring back to God what he lost. Right? That's like me wrecking your car and offering you a bicycle in exchange. Here, I'm sorry I wrecked your car. Here's a nice new bicycle. It's not the same thing. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org.